Hey everybody, this is Rabbit. welcome to the channel, and today we're going to be doing part 2 of our series on looking at the Magok line in the game of War Thunder in the Israeli tech tree. Now if you haven't seen the first part of the series, go ahead and check that out real quick. And as you can tell by the title, the Unstable, that all these vehicles do not have stabilizers. And they do kind of regularly fight vehicles that do have stabilizers. This is really only a problem at medium range. At close range, it's not a huge factor as you can just kind of hit the middle of the enemy. At longer ranges, it's usually just whoever can land shots first, and you do have the range fighters. Now this is actually Future Rabbit that's going to be doing the intro and also the conclusion at the end because it turns out Past Rabbit wasn't psychic and didn't realize that all of the battle ratings for the Magok series was about to change. And in total, out of the 16 vehicles, 12 of them went up in BR, exactly 1 BR. Now it turns out a lot of vehicles shifted up exactly 1 BR range, so it's not hugely impactful in terms of the enemies you fight. However, it does create some awkward situations in terms of your lineups and what tanks are necessarily useful for them, but it doesn't actually change the stats of the vehicles or by and large what they fight, so I'm going to leave the audio segment and the recording that I already did and just mentally ignore all of the mention of the vehicles being 7-7. All the vehicles in this video are currently 8-0. And at the very end of this video, I will rejoin you and we will take this away from Past Rabbit and to tell you how the vehicles currently stack up in the meta and their roles within the various lineups you can feel with Israel on the whole. So without further ado, here is my past self talking about the vehicles. And our very first vehicle today is going to be the Magok 3, and the Magok 3 is where we're going to start our little Magok drinking game. So there are three features of Magok that they go back and forth with a lot. The number one feature is the hull shape, so it goes back and forth between M48 and M60 hulls. The number two feature is the turret shape, which goes back and forth between the old uh, M60 and the new M60 turrets. And of course, adding or subtracting the overbarrel 50 cals. You might rationally think that because all these features are straight up upgrades, the tech tree would simply gain them and not lose them, but that's not actually how it works. So. We are going to do this little drinking game from the Magok 3 onward, uh, and I would definitely not recommend playing this drinking game while watching the entire series as a whole. Uh, always drink responsibly, don't drink and drive, etc, etc. Now, the first thing we're going to look at when we look at the Magok 3 is this is a Frankenstein tank. You have the, M4, you have the M48 hull, you have the M60 turret, the older M60 turret. You also have the M60 engine, which is actually worse than the M48 engine, which is kind of what Dobie. You have the overbarrel 50 cal with the 230 cals, and then you also have the main gun, which is the 105 from the uh, M60. So it's a bunch of different parts from a bunch of different vehicles, and you do kind of get the worst parts from all the vehicles, funnily enough. Like the M48 hull is mostly just weaker than the M60, but the M60 turret is mostly just weaker than the M68, at least the early ones. And like the M60 engine is kind of weaker than the M48 engine. But you do at least get the 105 millimeter gun you get the overbarrel 50 cal and this is also a pretty good time to talk about the 105 millimeter gun now the american m68 105 is what we're going to be seeing on every tank from now on and while the main anti-tank round will change a bit the utility rounds basically stay the same across every version for the entire rest of the series so we'll just go ahead and knock them out the first one is your heat round the high explosive anti-tank fin stabilized heat fs this round pins about 400 millimeters of armor. When you first get it, it's okay for dealing with particularly heavily armored opponents, especially because it doesn't change its penetration at longer distances. So if you are on longer range maps against heavier opponents. However, as you get more and more capable like main anti-tank rounds, especially things like darts, uh, the heat loses a lot of its uh, real utility. It does overpressure targets, so that could be useful against open top vehicles, but so does the next shell we're gonna talk about. Um, mostly I don't really take heat once I get access to darts, like once I have tanks with darts I usually just drop the heat entirely from my inventory because it doesn't have a lot of extra applications. The next round we're going to talk about is the Hesh round. The Hesh round is kind of an unusual high explosive round because what it does is when it hits and penetrates, instead of doing shrapneling in like an AoE, it actually does shrapneling perpendicular to the surface. So if you land it at the top of a tank, like on the copla or the roof, it's going to explode basically straight down into the tank. Um, you can also kind of do this, especially with lighter vehicles when they have a really weak lower front plate, you can hit the lower front plate and have it detonate up into the vehicle. So there's a lot of really weird goofy kills you can get with this vehicle with this kind of shell that you can't really get with other shells so i usually like to have two or three of them on hand but i don't like to take a lot of these shells because 
they don't have general utility. Like you can technically kill most things with a Hesh round, but the the level of accuracy you need with your shots is a little too high for some targets. But they are useful if all you see is like a Copla or all you see is like a little part of like a BMP or something around a building. Uh, they are pretty useful for landing kills where other rounds simply did can't. The last type of shell, pretty straightforward. It's a smoke round. Smoke round generates smoke. You can use it to cross dangerous areas to blind enemies at a distance. Um, I will say generally you want to put the smoke round as close to the enemy as you can because if you put the smoke round directly on top of you, now they have a relatively small area they can look at and focus on and try to guess where you are. If you put it on top of them, now they can't see anything. So, like, they just have no vision anywhere, so it's a lot harder for them to guess where you are. So that's, like, a general piece of advice for smoke, but honestly, you can probably figure out what to do with smoke. I usually take one or two of them, just as a utility round, so they're just nice to have. Now, for the Magok 3 in particular, its primary anti-tank round is a Sabo, uh, that pens around 360 millimeters. It doesn't have the best angled performance, but its flat performance is so good that it kind of overpowers its weak angled performance and broadly just makes it kind of a better shell than even some contemporaries that have better angled performance. It's also important to realize when looking at Sabos, because this is going to come up in a minute, that Sabo rounds do damage based on the amount of penetration they have left when they go through the armor. So if they just barely have enough pen to go through the armor, they do very little damage. So there's not really such a thing as having too much Sabo penetration because you like the penetration actually does translate into damage. Overall, I find the shell is incredibly effective. Like, I take a few heat rounds just because, especially at longer ranges, uh, it can be a little awkward against some of the heavier tanks because of its weak angled pen. But I don't use the heat rounds that much. I mostly just use the Sabo, and the Sabo, nine times out of ten, works perfectly fine. The damage is pretty consistent because it has such ridiculously high penetration, and you can mostly just click on the middle of enemies. Now, as far as the mobility of the vehicle, really doesn't change that much from the previous M48s we were just looking at. It's a hair worse because you do have a worse engine, you are a little heavier, but it's not really so much that you notice. And one really cool feature that this tank has in terms of its survivability is that it actually has a smoke grenade launcher, or it's essentially a 60mm mortar, but the game in game this is represented by it having effectively a smoke grenade launcher. You don't even have to research it, you just have a smoke grenade stock. and. A lot of vehicles at 7.7 do not have access to smoke grenades. So this is just a really cool feature to have on this vehicle, especially not even having to research it. As far as the armor, the armor, <laughs> you're about at the M48 level of, it's not, it will sometimes save you, but it's not in any way consistent. All of your surfaces are effectively rounded, so there's nothing you can do to improve the armor. Um, overall, I do feel like the Magok 3 is starting off the 7.7 like Magox as a pretty good offering. You have a nice combination of mobility, firepower, and armor. You have the overbarrel 50 cal. You have a really good stock armor piercing shell. And you don't really have any major downsides. Uh, it's not impressive, but it's also not bad by any stretch of the imagination. And for our next vehicle, we're going to do the Magok 3 ERA, the premium vehicle. And the Magok 3 ERA is very similar to the Magok 3, except it doesn't have the overbarrel 50 cal. Take a shot. Now, the big thing that the Magok 3 does have, despite losing the overbarrel 50 cal and one of the uh, one of the commander's machine gun, I believe it is, is you get the Blazer ERA package. This is the first time this ERA package appears in the game. At, well, it's at the lowest battle rating. It's also one of the lowest battle ratings for explosive reactive armor in general. Now, if you haven't used explosive reactive armor before, it does what it says on the 10. Uh, if a round strikes it, it will explode outwards and diffuse some of the energy of the round. These are significantly more effective against heat rounds, and there are a lot of heat rounds running around 7-7. Um, things like BMP-1s, almost all of the ammunition they have to defeat other tanks is heat rounds. Uh, you also have things like the Terms, which is often firing heat rounds. The armor protection on it, as far as the Blazer ERA, obviously isn't perfect. It has a lot of gaps in it, but it's really good at catching poorly aimed shots, and it can provide a pretty reasonable level of protection. On top of that, a pretty noticeable upgrade that you get is instead of just the one 60mm mortar firing smoke grenades, now you get a full bank of smoke grenades. You get four salvos of four grenades each. So this is actually a pretty good spread of smoke grenades to cover you if you need some time. Um, overall, I would say the Magok 3, uh, the mobility is about the same as the, 
the Magog 3 ERA's mobility is about the same as the base Magog 3 in the tech tree, even though you are a little heavier. It's not really anything you'd notice. The base armor excluding the ERA is effectively identical. But uh, overall, I do feel like it's basically an upgrade. Uh, losing the 50 cal, a little sad, but the ERA and the smoke banks actually do kind of make up for it. It's a decent-ish premium. The problem with the Israeli tech tree is the Israeli tech tree has a ton of 7.7 vehicles, as we're going to see in this video. Like, there are multiple 7.7s that we're not even going to talk about for uh, other MBT lines. So Israel's kind of inundated, so you don't really need it. Um, ironically, the USA one was actually more useful because USA didn't have a great 7.7 lineup or... They do have some 7.7 options, but they're not really standouts. So the USA one was actually slightly more useful than the Israeli one. Next up, we have the Magog 6. So the Magog 6 changes out the old M48 hull for the M60 hull. Take a shot. It still has the uh, older M60 turrets, and it does not have the overbarrel 50 cal yet. Now, the interesting thing about the Magog 6 is even though it technically comes after the 3, by and large it does feel like a bit of a downgrade. It is lighter than the Magog 3, not really so much that it significantly affects its mobility. It, it doesn't have the overbarrel 50 cal, it doesn't have the smoke of the Magog 3 at all. You have essentially the same shell. Um, all you really get for all of that is your hull armor is the better M60 hull, so it's a little better, but like that doesn't really help you that much. Like You shouldn't be taking shots to the hull anyway. So overall, the Magog 6 is a pretty weak offering. It's not unusable by any stretch of the imagination, but I do feel like the biggest problem with the Magog 6, same problem we kind of had with recommending the Magog 3 ERA as a premium, is there's just so many other 7.7s you could choose, and this one doesn't really stand out all that well. Um, overall, the Magog 6 is an aggressively okay tank at a very competitive battle rating. And for our next contestant, we're going with the Magog 6A. So the Magog 6A uses the newer M60 hull like the Magog 6, but it also uses the new M60 turret, take a shot, and it has an overbarrel 50 cal, take a shot. Now it also does have the commander's cobla for the M60 with 50 cal. And it actually downgrades its shell. It's actually using a shell that only has about 260 millimeters of flat pen, although it does have better angled performance. Now, the real problem with this shell, and what I was kind of running into when I was playing it, is the shell that both the 6 and the 3 use are kind of good at just aiming for the middle, and you'll consistently get good shrapnel patterns because they have such high penetration. This shell has much lower penetration, so even if it's going through, it's often doing weaker shrapnel patterns. And against heavier targets, often the shell just can't pen at all. Like, even with a better angled pen, the base pen is just too low. So I was having to run a lot more heat rounds with this tank. On top of that, not having the stabilizer and having the weaker pen created this awkward combination where I had to land better shots those shots were less consistent, and I had more trouble doing it because of a lack of a stabilizer. Now, you might rightfully think that the armor is noticeably improved, and it kind of is, but it does have a major problem. Like, the newer M60 turret does have noticeably better protection, it can block quite a few shells. The hull is also better, uh, it's sharper, so it's not like rounded, so you can't angle the hull. However, there is one big problem, and that is the Cobla. Remember how I said with the M48s that the Copa looked like a shot trap, but it wasn't actually a shot trap? Well, the Magog 6As is definitely a shot trap. So if you run into anybody with APHE, they can just shoot the Copa and kill your entire turret crew. Um, you don't run into people with APHE all the time. The problem is when you do run into them, you can't hide a weak point on top of your tank. It's very rare that you can get shots at people without exposing this. So you're never truly safe, even in the down tiers where your opponent should theoretically be a lot worse than you and where your improved armor should help. They just have to hit this magic, like, make you go away button and they'll knock you out. Um, on top of the fact this is kind of already foldered, which, you know, good on them, but it also makes this vehicle feel very redundant and very not fun to play. This was easily my least favorite vehicle to get footage for for this episode. 
And for our last vehicle today, we're going to be going with the Magok 5. So the Magok 5 uses the M48 hull, take a shot, uses the old M60 turret, take a shot, and doesn't have an over barrel 50 cal, take a shot. The older, the Magok 5 is kind of weird because it's actually pre-Magok 6 and Magok 6A, so I'm not really sure what they're going, doing with this order. But anyway, the Magok 5 does have the Blazer ERA package that we just saw on the Magok 3 ERA. Still reasonably effective at 8.0, actually. You're still fighting a lot of the same enemies. Additionally, even though it doesn't have a stabilizer, it does get access to M111, and you should get to know and love this shell. We're going to be seeing it a lot, especially in the next episode. This is your first armor piercing fin stabilize, or armor piercing discarding Sabo fin stabilize, APFSDS. And this is your first one of these dart rounds, and this thing is fantastic. Like at this battle rating, it will basically pin anything at any range. Uh, you can kind of just aim center mass on everybody and take them out. The armor with the ERA is reasonably effective. You also get the same banks of smoke launchers that you have on the Magog 3 ERA, so you have a decent smoke screen. Again, 8.0, still not at the point where that's standard. Um, overall, I found this vehicle worked incredibly well despite the lack of stabilizer, and I think a lot of that is due to just how good the round is. Even though you don't have a stabilizer, you don't need laser precise shots to knock enemies out. So you can kind of fire from the hip or just kind of dead reckoning your shots a lot more easily. And at long range, this thing is positively lethal. The combination of the ERA reducing the efficiency of a lot of smoke rounds or, or reducing the efficiency of a lot of heat rounds and your own stereoscopic rangefinder plus your Sabo that travels incredibly fast. This thing is actually a fantastic sniper on really big maps like Sinai. Um, I actually really enjoyed the Magog 5. I found it was a lot, like I didn't initially, both when I started spading it and even when I went back to it, think I was going to enjoy the experience as much, but I really found this vehicle just clicked with me. Now, as far as rating the vehicles is concerned, I was originally going to put the Magog 5 in A tier as a bit of a rogue pick, but now I actually think it is legitimately an A tier pick just because of it has a really effective shell, has the ERA, has the smoke grenades, and while a lot of other things went up, it stayed at 8.0. So I do think it is comfortably an A tier pick. The Magog 3 and Magog 3 ERA are a little questionable. They're mostly just downgrades over the Magog 5, and they're currently at the same battle rating, which is a little rough. However, they're not unusable at their battle rating by any means. The problem is that you currently have seven tech tree and one premium option that go in the same slot. So the competition is pretty fierce, and it's a matter of personal preference as to whether or not you think either of them really are up to the challenge. Now, when you look at the Magog 6, I was originally going to put it in C tier, but at this point I kind of have to put it in F tier. It's not completely unusable by any stretch of the imagination. However, you have so many other options and it just kind of doesn't stand out all that well. However, it is you do have to research and buy it anyway to proceed along the tech tree. If you have the silver to crew it, it can help your grind along a little with the Magog 5 and you're not going to have a bad time playing it necessarily, it's just unlikely to be one of your picks for your like long-term 8.0 lineup. And last we have the Magog 6A, I don't like the shell, I don't like the Coppola, fortunately the Israelis don't like it any more than I do, and this is the last time we'll be seeing it. And of course it's foldered, so the game kind of makes the decision for you to not uh, go after it, and who are you to argue, so throw that thing straight in F tier. And that concludes our video for today. If you want to see the rest of the series, make sure you hit that subscribe button and make sure you turn notifications on. Feel free to comment on whether you like any of these Magox in the series, why you do, why you don't. And of course, make sure to hit that like button. That's always appreciated. I hope you enjoyed the video. Hope you had fun. Have a nice day, everybody.